For nearly 100 years, Leinster House has been the home of the Parliament in Ireland. Once the townhouse of the Earl of Kildare, its hallowed halls have borne witness to the most important political decisions in our state's short history. The 270-year-old building is now in need of substantial repair and restoration to protect and conserve it for future generations. What they're getting back is a properly restored building, fit for purpose for another 100 years. Specialists will be required to strengthen the floor structure and the roof, to upgrade fire resistance measures and to replace old wiring. Everybody who comes into it is just in love with it and it, it makes you want to be a better person. The house will be vacated to protect and restore its fine historic plasterwork, woodwork and stonework features. It's a wonderful Palladian building. There's an enthusiasm about doing this and, and doing it well. That work began towards the end of 2017. To restore something, to keep the fabric as it is, and to put a floorboard back down where it went the first day it was laid. That's important. To me, it's important. We wanted to update you in relation to the uh, important refurbishment and restoration and protection works. I, I think it's about eight years ago since it was initially identified uh, that works would be required uh, upon the building. Works were delayed because of the onset of the serious financial difficulties that uh, confronted the country. The building during that period has uh, continued to decline. It's an internationally important building and our main um, driver in this is to make sure that the property is protected from fire and from total loss. In terms of the money, the full estimation of what the cost is is not something we can make at the moment. I think if you uh, are conscious of the challenges that arise when you're working on an old building, what is going to cost will depend on what is found as the project is developed. We have to protect it and we have to preserve it in, in terms of the future. The senators, the people here of Parliament are interested in what's happening to the building. So despite the fact that they're inconvenienced and you have a major scaffold going up, there's an enthusiasm about doing this and, and doing it well. Construction of the original Leinster House began in 1745 and it was the residence of the Fitzgerald family, who were the Earls of Kildare and later the Dukes of Leinster. The Fitzgeralds sold the house to the Dublin Society in 1815, and when the Oireachtas took ownership of the building in the 1920s, the former supper room became the members' library and reading room, now stripped bare. The former ballroom became the Shannet, now relocated. The entire second floor had already been vacated for many years for health and safety reasons, and now all offices and reception rooms have been vacated to allow the essential work to commence. OK, lads, can I just have your attention? This toolbox talk is on fire safety. We don't allow any hot works in Leinster House. No grinding, no welding. I'm working in the construction for 43 years. I'm at it since I was 15. I served my time as a carpenter. There are three sets of fire extinguishers on each floor. My job is my basically finishes. I'm a finishing foreman from a joinery point of view. I make sure that they are to a standard and put into the specification that they should be. To come into the historic Leinster House, for me, it's one of the highlights of my career. Floor strengthening is one of the uh, bigger elements involved in historic Leinster House. It's an old building. These joists have sagged. Some of these rooms have sagged over 50 mil. So they're gone, so they need to be strengthened. The bow will be in the middle of the room. It's always in mid-span. You have a ceiling underneath, which weighs it quite a bit, and that's what happens. It pulls down on these joists. We put in extra joists to give the floor the extra strength. These joists here are fixed to the existing joists. 
Between the joists we have chlorophyll and it gives the protection from the room below. Not only that, we have two mastic beads between the joists. There's two beads of it and when the two of them are bolted together, it seals. If there is a fire down below, no flame can come up through the actual joist itself. The air is cut off. If this work is not done, you could lose Leinster House. There's no point in strengthening the, the floor if we don't do some work in strengthening the ceiling down below. These ties are put in up through the actual ceiling itself. Down below the ceiling, you see lines going across the ceiling and every one of their grids has a hole drilled up. And then we tied the piano wire off on a steel strap. So the whole lot is just held up. Not overdone, but just to hold the plaster work from sagging again. While it was known that repairs were needed to wall cracks at the southeast corner of the building, the full extent of the seriousness of these wall cracks, as well as the failed door and window arches, was not apparent until these areas were opened up for more detailed inspection. What we have here is brick wall coming down and then it sits on top of a timber studding piece and enters a void, a complete hole right down to the floor below. Now, quite aside from it being a problem for fire travel to come up, resting a whole lot of bricks on top of a timber stud, <laughs> in anyone's language, is not the thing to do. From our visual inspection, that was something left from its original period of building. From 1748. So uh, people would say it stayed up, uh, but you can also see here a lot of distress cracking through the bricks. So while it's held it up, it's not holding it up in a way that's not causing distress to the brick. We find here fire gaps as well, which we have to seal up. But we also find bricks and mortar of very uh, poor quality. And if you look at the mortar here, the thing is just literally just breaks up in my hand, goes to dust. And this issue of having a fire gap like this, it, you can't leave something like that. So we're going to have to fireproof this, but we're also going to have to fix these bricks to make them solid and secure again. And the other thing that we see is up at the top up here, a number of the bricks are starting to fall out because of some distress going on there. And the distress doesn't stop, it con usually continues. We have to find out if there's something pushing it from above or is it just the mortars that uh, weren't very well done at the time. This restoration work is being carried out on an 18th century house that is regarded as historically significant in that much of similar Georgian architecture has disappeared from the city. Leinster House was built from 1745 onwards by the Fitzgerald family who were then Marquess of Kildare, one of the preeminent aristocratic families in Ireland. It's essentially a country house built in the city and they would have entertained political allies, maybe even political enemies, um, and they would have done so on a very grand scale. The family make a decision then in 1815 to sell the house, and it's bought by the Dublin Society, which later becomes the Royal Dublin Society. And the aim of the society is to create something of an artistic or cultural hub within the city itself, and this is perfectly located for that. And then, in August of 1922, Michael Collins uh, entered into an agreement with the RDS to lease Leinster House. He saw uh, the potential that was there. So then it becomes the Houses of Parliament, and that's the way it has remained for the last hundred years. In many ways, it symbolises the beginning of the New Ireland and the Independent Ireland post-1922. But it's also a throwback to a very different Ireland uh, of the 18th century, when the house would have been regarded as a symbol of colonial oppression. So in, in effect, it's where the two Irelands can be seen simultaneously. So from an historical perspective, from an architectural perspective and a cultural perspective, it's an extremely important building.
some of the um, the new floor joists going into the building. So to get them in, you know, onto the first floor there, that's uh, that's how we do it. Take a window window. My role, um, make it all happen, I suppose. Site manager, if you want the job title, but um, yeah, pull it all together. It's a big project, obviously, it's a prestigious project. From day to day, I suppose it varies somewhere between 35 to today, we have 52 on site, including OPW architects ourselves. Obviously, with a building of any historical nature, you know, restoration, conservation type project, you will find the unexpected. Um, I suppose the big challenge is to deal with that within the program. And um, the next couple of big milestones will be the uh, the delivery of stone, I suppose, and the scaffolding completion. The, the scaffolding completion that everybody can see. elevation there where we have some of the guys removing and replacing some of the stone. First of all it's a survey of every stone on this elevation, surveyed by the OPW and numbered by the OPW. If you can see pick up there the stones marked in red or highlighted there are the stones that the guys in the background here are removing. Each stone will be itemised as to what we do with the stone. Take it out, repair it in place um, or nothing at all in some cases. There's probably maybe in total between all the parapet stones, over 100 stones coming off this one side of the building to be replaced. Um, some of the stone here. The schedule will tell us that that stone there, EF143 on that one, is it 143? That one there will save for, re for replacement. You don't find stuff like this nowadays. You can't recreate this, so yeah, we must uh, preserve it the best way we can. Uh, it's nice work. It's nice work. It's not concrete. Every room that has a fireplace has to have a steel in. Here we have one of the seals already in place. We're putting the second one in place here. And then the third piece will be going across on the fireplace, which gives support to the heart. That's the most important part. The weight in that, you know, you have to get it up onto the scaffold, you have to get it into the window, you know, without doing any damage to the fabric of the building, which is most important. Consultation, discussion and decision-making relating to the stonework repair on Leinster House was made more difficult by the fact that the house was originally built with different types of stone. However, there were historical reasons for that. Formal entrance for sort of entertaining, and this was a house of entertainment, was here from Molesworth Street. Kildare Street, named after the Earl of Kildare, then the Duke of Leinster, coming into what was the front of the house in your carriage and entering then to this um, entrance into um, the rooms which were very much for entertainment. This stone here at the front of Leinster House is our bracken limestone and the, the difficulty at the time of building was actually bringing that here from near Navan. So they concentrated their good stone here. This was to impress. The back of the house, it's much easier to get granite, so the back of the house is in granite. And on the left-hand side, where the National Museum is now, had the kitchens and the stables. The stone is Dublin Calp, um, a cheaper, easier to get stone. Where we have a problem is you have here Art Bracken. It has deteriorated with pollution, particularly in the carved elements. You can see very worn elements here, like the one there marked number 30. You'll see there's a piece of stone literally about to come off. And with freeze-thaw cycles in three to five years, that piece will be on the ground right over the entrance. So we'll be addressing all of those.
Once repairs are completed to the internal brick walls, they will need replastering. Originally, a lime-based plaster was used and the plan is to replace it with similar material. But first, tests must be carried out. This plaster here is a trial for the design team to see that they're happy with it and it coincides with what was in the original building. But it would be horse hair in it and that's what binds it together. The animals had their hair cut, so they were recycling the whole time as well. It's better there, look, you see a lot of it there. It's quite stable, as you can see. The lat everything is quite firm. There's no instability in it there at the moment. These are not sawn, these are hands, these are hand on. You can see by the irregularities in them, they're all over the place. The spaces are crucial. If the spaces are not right, you don't get any key. The key goes to the back. That's what actually hangs the material in position. There's another float coat to go on that and then it'll be skimmed over with lime putty, a flat lime putty to meet back up with the, with the cornice like, and it'll, it'll last another three, four hundred years. Like the lad that was standing here three hundred years ago, we're doing the same now as he done there. You know, he might look a bit older looking and a bit withered, but... <laughs> the other thing that we would have discovered here is the parget. And this was underneath the floor for comfort and, and uh, stop the wind and all blowing up and insulation. But that's original, and you can see how much hair was in it. You'll have horse hair in it, you could have goat hair in it, and there was always speculation if you had a lot of goat hair, they were very, very wealthy. The fire rating is, a, is an issue. We can't just put back in the likes of this anymore either. But it has to be the regulations are the regulations, and we have to keep with them. <laughs> George Boyle is the architectural advisor to the Houses of the Oroctus. She has been involved in the project from the very beginning. A building that isn't being constantly monitored of this age and constantly repaired and constantly loved is only really kind of deteriorating. And I used to feel so sad passing every, every day that I would see just a little bit more grime or a little bit more spalling on the stonework or the timbers would be kind of just a little bit more spongy when you kind of touch them and little details would be kind of melting on the plaster work. It's a little bit like icing sugar, you know. This is a very, very busy uh, workspace stuffed with offices and filing cabinets and they just want to get on with the job. So we did a kind of a questionnaire for every single person who sat in any single seat about how they felt working here, what could be improved, how it could be better. And we got huge feedback, but I think what the people here found most of all was that they got this warm, engaged feeling that everybody was on board and that everybody actually wanted to see the vision. They wanted to see it happening and they wanted to see it rolling out. This is the Shanna Chamber, well, the former. Shannon Chamber and the future Shannon Chamber. Of all the functions that were active and alive in Leinster House when we knew that we had to clear the building out to do this job, this was the one that had most head scratching and just so many people affected, you know. This was very iconic. Everybody who comes into it is just in love with it and it, it makes you want to be a better person, you know, it has that kind of effect on you. You can really understand how people would find it very hard to imagine transitioning anywhere from this and why people were a bit scared about the change that came. This is the old RT studio. This would have been where you had the less important rooms. We believe these seashells were put in here as sound uh, barrier, so that sound from up here wouldn't travel down to the better rooms. It's a social issue, I suppose, and it was readily available because they could get these on this, uh, the coast at Irish Town in 1740, 1750, sold as food in the streets of Dublin, and this was readily available as waste. We are not aware of it being used in other houses. Uh, either here or in Britain, as far as our research has gone to date. 
seems to be a practical, sensible solution. Its effectiveness we have yet to test. For a lot of people, when this is finished, people are going to say, what did you do for a year? And you spent X amount of money and Y amount of time, and it looks like it did before. But what they're getting back is a properly restored building, fit for purpose for another 100 years, and it needed to be done. The work had been deferred for periods of time because of financial issues, but Ireland has to really take those things seriously. It's an issue of heritage and conservation. It's not got to do with what, what that house is used for. And I think if we take our democracy seriously, you then invest in your democracy and your heritage. That'll be kept there as a, an artifact found. Left there? Left there, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'll be there as when our um, successors come and do the next work in a hundred years' time, it'll be there for them to see as well. We might leave a note and sort of say, I was here. <laughs> the question is whose name would go on it? That'll be the issue. Visiting us at night and during the day sometimes. Um, some of the lads have met the fox walking around the top level of the scaffolding there. He's all but waved at them. Um, it's a town fox, obviously, he's not a bit showy. Well, we've had evidence of it, yeah, like the footprints. We've seen the footprints before. We didn't know what it was. I said, what? Is it a cat? Told it was a cat first of all. Until somebody says they've seen the fox. And I said, we're just leaving it. The boys have met him walking down the main stairs there. I've spoken to some guys, I have a friend that I was talking to them earlier really on, the gamekeeper. And um, Oh, he came, did he give you any idea of what they No. Um, the only way to get him is trap him. And get rid of him. And, and relocate him. You wouldn't like to harm him, that, right? but we need to get rid of him. That's a good topic for the 10 o'clock tea time. It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With major restoration needed on the roof of Leinster House, a decision was made to cover the site so that work could continue uninterrupted. Putting the roof on, while it's not that common around uh, most sites, it's something we've done once or twice before. Having the roof on, though, is a big thing. It opens up all the work. It's not going to be susceptible to rainwater or damage from the weather. The stone can come off, the slates can come off. The inner roof is taken off and, you know, it just opens up so much work. So what the guys are doing there is taking off the slate. The middle guy you can see there is, is etching a number on them so they know where they came from. So each slate, insofar as possible, goes back on in the same place it came off. So the slates come off, back down into these boxes here and taken down to the compound for storage for reuse. So they photograph every slate in place. These other two guys here are obviously just taking off the timber lats of the slates on there because all that gets replaced. New timber. A uh, new breedable memory, a new felt, if you like, um, and then the state goes back on. It's a lot of work, but again, it's important we can put it back the way it was. A lot of these slates will be original. Conservation, restoration, um, minimal intervention, minimal intervention. Um, the whole thing. With the closing of the Shannon Chamber for essential works, a new home was needed for the upper house of the Oireachtas. For the second time in its history, Shannon Erin was to be temporarily accommodated in the National Museum of Ireland, next door to Leinster House. The summer months of 2017 saw the transformation of the National Museum's ceramic room into the new Shannon. George Boyle and OPW architect Hilary Vandenberg were key overseers of this relocation. A relocation that needed not just practical considerations, but political ones as well. One of the things we were asked to do was to make sure that the seating arrangements 
in this shannad would be exactly the same as the existing shannad because evidently moving one chair or one position slightly can cause you know a huge number of problems yes. and and the, the reason for wanted, that i mean in mm. fairness it's not um that they're not flexible it's mm. that there's a team of government and there's a team of opposition and within those teams there are parties so for every single senator there is a delegate unit with their name on it. So you can't just say, well, actually, we've only room for eight in this row, mm. so you'll have to lose the ninth chair. It has to be nine. There's no brief for the Shannon. We only have one in the country. So this exercise has been very useful because we've had to ask an awful lot of questions. Every time we were stripping something out of the existing Shannon, we are saying, well, why is that person connected to here? And why, wh what is this connection doing? So we can put together now a brief for a Shannad, so that in 20 years' time, if another Shannad is built somewhere else, we actually know at this point these were the requirements. The sitting day, September 2017, actually, uh, it worked incredibly well, worked really smoothly. Senators came in, sat down at their seats, order of business began, and... Um, it worked. Being able to move the Shannad to a building adjacent to Leinster House was very convenient, but there was still an issue of providing easy access for politicians. The solution was uncovered by going back to old drawings. This is the linking room between Leinster House and the National Museum. Now, this was the leader of the Shannad's office, and there was actually a fireplace there. Um, we knew from earlier 1926 drawings that it was likely that there was some kind of connection there or had been at some stage. It had probably been covered over in the 1960s. So we were able to take it out and hey presto, we had a connection. So we're effectively going back to the building's original uh, circulation. There are 90 windows throughout historic Leinster House. Some of them are still in place since the original construction in the 1700s. Each window has been individually examined and the extent of repairs needed is on a case-by-case -case basis. The windows have been brought back to full working order, improving the comfort of the rooms and reducing energy loss. This is uh, one batch of the window sashes and shutters from Historic Leinster House out in the Lambstone workshop. They come from various areas of the building and all numbered from the first floor and ground floor and each window goes back into its own frame within the building with its own shutter. They're here to be worked on to have the paint stripped, glazing uh, repaired. So this is the bottom sash of a window on the second floor of Leinster House, um, where the stairs are. It's a very early window, 1740 to 1750 when the building was first built. It's in quite good condition and it has a mixture of glasses in it. It has two pieces of original cylinder glass and two pieces of modern glass. Generally, by looking at the glass at the right angle with the light on it, you'll notice just imperfections in the more original blown glass, whereas more modern float or drawn glasses wouldn't have uh, small blowing defects in them. The glass we will use for the replacement, it's a hand-blown cylinder glass, um, which we import, and it replicates quite accurately the original glass. So it has the little imperfections, the little seeds and swirls, that means it will read like the original glass. I get great satisfaction out of somebody coming in and saying, look, we're going to clean these back and just to get the highlight back into the door, bring the, back, bring the door back to what it was originally. You get some doors and people put hardboard over and they close all this off because it looks old, but to me, the joinery is everything. 
But down in the basement now, we've set up our own joinery shop in the basement, so we can actually work on the doors. You have old uh, ironmongery that's been taken away. So a lot of this has to be patched. This is a pitch pine. You won't really get pitch pine anymore, but hopefully that we'll be able to patch this with a pitch pine old floorboard, that when you do patch it, it looks the same. And it's the same type of timber. All floorboards will be used in some light, even if a floorboard has a big lump gone out of it and it's deemed, look, it can't go back down. We'll use that floorboard for patching other floorboards. So you never waste them. As you can see, it's no ordinary floorboard. It's all powered out by hand. Every one of them is by hand. So you can understand that a floorboard can only go back where it was taken from. And that's where documentation is very important. It's on the first floor, which is FF, and it's room 006, and it's board 5C, and we know exactly where that board belongs. And to put a floorboard back down where it went the first day it was laid, that's important. To me, it's important, and I think it should be important. This is a very historic building, and I think definitely it should be put back and cared for as much as possible. Almost eight months into the job, the Oroctus Commission gets a tour. Will it be just cleaned or will there be Just any cleaning kind of really on this or, one. There are yeah. some needs, a few minor repairs. Yeah. It's just a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Well today we've taken the opportunity to give the Commission uh, a detailed view of the exact work that's going on here. Up to now people have been quite impressed by the scaffolding going on outside the building, but no one could actually see what was going on inside and the loving care that's going into every single room. The main job is to strengthen the floors, yeah. to uh, fire protect them. Instead of taking stuff out, it was always a case of we just put in a new wire and put in new, and then all of a sudden, you know, we're pulling back the, the and looking and seeing there's thousands of wires. Exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. So this is a good opportunity to get everything done. Oh, yeah. and we'd be putting extra supports hanging onto that plaster from above. Particular focus now on the beautiful ceiling. We took it for granted very much uh, in the past, but seeing what's happening, seeing the risks and the damage that's had accrued to it over years, realised the vital importance of doing this work. And to bring them back to their original glory, you really have to, to take it very carefully. It's, it's painstaking work, but it's the right thing to do. It looks uh, so different, but I can still uh, see in my mind's eye uh, what it used to look like. Hopefully we'll be back here in about a year. They're working well, yeah. They're coming well, steel toes. They're amazing, aren't they? They'll be very handy for canvassing, actually. Look at those soles. <laughs> we don't know if we get to keep them or not. We have to talk to the count corner. <laughs> If somebody offered them to me, I wouldn't say no. I live in the countryside, so a pair of boots like these would be very useful. <laughs> Tests on the lime plaster have proved successful and plastering can begin. It's a time-consuming job as three layers of lime plaster will be applied to every wall. The material is compatible with the building. It's a far softer material than sand and cement render, which would be typically used nowadays. So it accommodates the movement in the building. Master plasterer George O'Malley cuts a distinctive figure around Leinster House as he catches up with his crew. We're custodians. We're passing through. Leinster House will be here a long time after we're gone. The lads that work with me all understand that. We all understand our place in history. George has restored many ceilings and murals in Irish historic buildings and here in Leinster House his team have had many impressive ceilings to repair and conserve Well it's designed by Richard Castle very similar to the entrance to Rusborough House it's multi-layered as you can see the plasterers knew that it didn't have to be absolutely to a grid accurate that it had to be aesthetically pleasing when you look up at it from here, that all the bits of the geometry had to work. 
The great beauty about this is that we're absolutely convinced that the original work is Michael Stapleton. His work is instantly recognisable and that it's really delicate. If you look at the griffin, the foliage that comes out from his tail is all freehand. That, to me, is a Stapleton signature. It's absolutely a work of beauty to me. The stone used on the facade of the Kildare Street side of Leinster House in the mid-1700s was limestone from Ardbracken in County Meath. That quarry has since closed, so replacement stone had to be sourced elsewhere. That search ended in County Cavan, where a limestone quarry had recently been opened at Ross, near Loch Sheelan. The boulders are extracted from here and transported to the Mourns in County Down, where McConnells and Sons machined them to order for Leinster House. To me, this area is one of the most beautiful in the world, the mountains of Mourn with a sweep down to the sea. The, the mountains, they're not made from limestone. They're all uh, from granite. You can't get limestone in this area, so that's why we had to go further afield. We send the lorry down for, for these blocks. The raw stone was chosen because they felt it was the, the closest to Leinster House original stone, Art Bracken. This is stone number 32. Uh, and then uh, if, you, if we can get in around the back and get past the dog, the dog keeps an eye on things. We can see in here, 42. We could lead it upwards in the regions of maybe 100 stones, 100 stones plus. From Leinster House, we get a template of the stone that's required. And from that template, we can then make up the 3D model on the computer. And that's what the machine recognises that has to be made. I just love the stone. I just love to see the shapes coming out. Um, to think of how it was done years ago, uh, when there was no saws and no technology that we have today, it's just amazing how them old craftsmen were able to make and design such beautiful buildings. This is Ross Limestone from Cavan, and then it was worked on by McConnells up in County Down. We have to replace this string course from our bracken with this new one, and this is one of the last pieces now to go in, and you can see the stainless steel fixing to stabilise it. That wouldn't have been there traditionally. That ties it back into the wall properly, and there's a special grout we use on that in the hole in the wall that will grip that into the historic wall that brings the stability level up. Just under here is a rain drip for the water as it runs to the edge for it to fall down. And you can see in the pieces over here, all of that is gone. And you can see now when I pull this, you can see how the whole stone is just coming apart. Now it's given a long service life, but now for us for the future, we need to replace that for the, for the next generations to come. While fireproofing was needed on every floor of the building, all steel beams and columns needed fireproofing too. In the library, timber pillars had to be removed to expose the steel behind. It was very difficult to get them off without doing any damage. We had to find a joint in the column so that we could open it up, part the column and lift it away. We tried to find where the joint was in it. The amount of paint that's on it, we had to get a stripper in, a paint stripper. Sorry about that, I didn't mean a paint stripper, so we could get back to the raw timber to see if we locate where the joint was in the column. But you can see how well made they are. I mean, you're talking time-wise, weeks, months, you know, to get this, get this together. A lot of it's done by hand.
This is an old fireplace that was found when the renovation started and it was unknown because it was in behind a partition here. And this would be one of the original fireplaces. It's unique because it's egg-shaped. And here, here's the top apex of it that goes round here. So it was something interesting to find, you know, because uh, something you don't find every day. It's nice to do a bit of work on something that's different, you know. That'd be the shape of it there. It's egg-shaped. It'll have a lot of cleaning on it, it'll be the main thing. But we'll try to keep any damage that's on it, any indents or, 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 or erasions that's on it, we'll try to keep them because it's of historical interest. There's no good in making it like brand new, you know? So what you nearly see there will be what we'll have at the end of the day. The ornate ceiling in the Shannad has had various repairs done to it down through the decades. With the room now stripped out, the OPW are using this opportunity to bring in specialist Richard Ireland for a thorough inspection. But there are definitely areas which are not looking so neat. Part of it might be the original cast element in the 18th century. I'm a historic plaster specialist spend a lot of time looking at historic buildings throughout Ireland and throughout the UK. And this, the shattered ceiling, really important piece of wired plaster work. All around this section, it's very smooth. Uh, it was heavily restored and repaired in the 1980s. And it's really being able to assess, are they performing still? And it seems to be fine. I think we'll, we'll go up and have a, a look from behind. These buildings are really important. They're the kind of cultural photograph album. They're all your family's memories. They're everything that's built on you and made you. It's really critical to try and keep stuff going, preserve it. When it's gone, it's gone. So preserve it is important. At the end of summer 2018, a new doll session is about to take place. The members are all back this week, and in fairness to them, they see the scrim. It's very realistic on TV. It almost looks like the house is finished. You can't see the scaffolding behind the scrim. But in fairness to members, their focus is now on the budget and all of the other spectrum of politics. Uh, they're leaving it to us to get the building back. It's a living, working space. It's not just a museum. But we hope we've got the planning right, that we've consulted with the people who are going to be in the offices and that the architects and the engineers understand the functions of each room. So the rooms will be equipped not just to be beautiful period and historical rooms, but they are part of a working parliament. So all this cabling is a one-off opportunity to take out what was there, which was built up over 100 years or maybe more, and put in the modern services, future-proofing. So we have to make sure we get that right. We're not going to be able to come back in here and take up these floors again. You'd always, when you'd be doing a historic work, you'd be trying to see how much you could salvage. So the authentic original slates are reused as much as you can. So you go through a selection process. You take them down, you do an initial selection, like good, bad, and then you start looking at, it's the size of the hole for the nail, damaged from years of movement, and then the thickness of the slate. And then you work out how you're going to relay them again. Since some of the slates were badly damaged, what we did was we went and salvaged slates from other areas. So, for instance, some of Boland's Mill slates are being used here. We're going back to the original way, the proper way of laying slate, because historically what they did, as they were laying it, overlapped more as it came to close to the gutter. And the reason for that was to reduce uh, water getting in, but also wind uplift, because wind uplift at an edge is about two to four times the wind up lift that you get up on the top. So you can see the overlapping is more than half the slate, and then it overlaps this slate. So at the end, you get enough weight all happening at one place. So I have a house of my own which has a low slope, and every time there's a storm, I can hear the slates going up and down, up and down. So you don't want that on a historic building.
if you look at the acorn and the, and, the, and the oak leaf, you can actually see it's so detailed. You can actually see some of the acorns still in the shell, and then you see some of them that have popped out. It's so natural looking. That's done by hand. I think it, it, it's, it's a lovely piece of work. And to try and take the paint off that without doing any damage to it, that was the problem. What are we stripping it with? We have to be very, very careful on how we go about stripping. But you can see it's so clear and, and the detail on it now, after it being stripped, looks really well. Unfortunately, you know, we can't leave them like that. We have to seal them again and paint them. This is one here that we've just started to prime. But the whole thing about it is you can see the detail still. It still stands out. Whereas if you'd have left it the way it was and then still applied the paint, you'd actually lose the detail altogether. Uh, you might just keep, keep me posted Rory on what it reaches there. I'm just up on the south elevation there. Just, I'd just be interested to see what the wind is gusting at there as the afternoon goes on, yeah? Yeah, no worry. We have um, a high wind warning over the next couple of days there. Winds due to gust coming from a southerly direction, which is coming from this direction here, due to gust at about 100 kilometres an hour on Wednesday afternoon. So, again, all we're doing there is putting on a bit of protection to stop the wind hitting directly onto that brick and possibly loosening it and loosening some of it back in onto the historic ceilings. So that there will just let the wind, any wind that does come, come up across the roof as it's designed to do. But these rafters here, you can see, you can see there was some work done to the rafters, largely in good condition. This here is probably the worst part of the roof where there's a dip in the roof. So the roof had started to dip down and that's the reason why it's still exposed at the moment. We'll put in a rafter alongside each of those rafters, but raising them up slightly, which will take the dip out of the roof, keeping the old rafters in place so everything stays. A lot of the work that goes in, that's going into this house to, to preserve it for the next 100 years is hidden. It's in the floors, it's strengthening the floors, it's all structural work. When we all go away, scaffolding is down, everything is done and dusted and everybody's gone. People will not see or realise, I suppose, the extent of the work that went into this. How do you get anybody to understand the amount of work that's gone into that, you know? Unless we do what we're doing here and record it. Next time... The original benches from the Shannad are renovated. Be a bit of piece of writing that does be scratched into the polish. They'll keep all the writing and so the, the history stays in the fabric of the furniture. The floors are replaced. This section of floor here has gone back down exactly the way we've taken it up. Painting begins. And the artwork returns. So we have Charles Stuart Parnell here. It's quite an intimate painting, so it's perfect in between the windows. Thank you.